Je m'appelle Sébastien. My name is Sebastian dos Santos Borges. I go on polar expeditions with my huskies. Most of these dogs I got from the Animal Protection Agency, the SPA. Toute l'année, je m'entraîne avec eux. During the year, I train with them in France, with the goal of being able to spend several months in total solitude in the frozen north. A bit of snow? Oh, that's so nice. So nice with the snow. Come on, Igloo. Come on. These dogs are my companions. They're my friends, my little four-legged family. I've tried to live like Robinson Crusoe, but that true survival scenario isn't really my universe. And society, our societies such as they are, aren't really my universe either. These expeditions allow me to find that mythic balance point between our societies and the life of Robinson Crusoe. For the dogs and me, the adventure begins in France, with training. It's the same as for us. That's to say it's really training where they work at the basics. Bulk, speed, resistance, strength, there are different kinds of training. So, I've already got my two lead dogs, Yukon Rose and Igloo. It's true, I train with them every day, every day. They're really always with me. And there has to be complicity, a bond that forms little by little with the lead dogs. And there's the little baby of the family, a little Alaskan Malamute called Nayuk which means little lady in Inuit. And this is her apprenticeship. Beyond physical training, this is also going to be real psychological training, training the bonding, trust and complicity with the lead dogs. This is what will be directing the sled team. It's a link which is created between the leaders and me. For me, a musher is a little bit like someone who has huskies and trains them so he can enjoy himself. Whereas above all, I want them to enjoy themselves as well, return to the land of their ancestors, rediscover their origins through these expeditions to the frozen north. For it's these sled dogs who are going to take me will create the adventure. It's not only me that makes this adventure happen. I'm going to let them go here so they can shake out their legs a bit. And like that, they can go back to the chalet freely. Yeah, afterwards you feel quite alone. After that, the skate goes a lot slower, but it's pretty enjoyable. Here in France, it's like an expedition for me. I don't eat during the day. I have a meal in the morning and a meal in the evening to really acclimatize to a polar expedition. And it's the same for the shower. I have an outside shower. The water's around 7 or 8 degrees to try and get myself acclimatized to temperatures like minus 40 or minus 60 Celsius. It's a deal with them. It's true that it's not their choice, but they're born as huskies. It's them that really hold the key to that universe of the frozen north, the lands up there, the boreal lands. 
by taking me aboard this icy ship with my sled, by transporting my things. And in exchange, well, it's true that in my universe, our universe, our societies, I try to offer them as much as I can the power to free themselves, to roam, train as well, go running and swimming. There are two sides to this. In fact, people see me a little bit like a dropout because I live in my dreams and my fascination for this. And at the same time, they see me going out with my headlamp, training with the dogs. It's true that I do look a bit like an alien. But what's good about this for my friends as well as my family is that they see me wake up smiling in the morning and that's what matters. There are all sorts of training styles when it comes to huskies. In winter you can use the sled in the snow. Off season in autumn you can use the snow blade or the cart on the tracks. And when it's very, very hot, it's true that with all that fur they don't like the heat. We go training in water, so they're really at the ambient temperature and they go back and forth swimming. Go on dogs, go on. Into the water, gently now. It's like it is for us, that's to say it's a lot softer when they go into the aquatic environment, for the articulations as well as for the muscles, it's a lot more flexible and they'll carry on working with this additional coolness. They'll be working, I mean, at an agreeable temperature, the surrounding temperature. The water here is at between 18 and 19 degrees Celsius, so it's a lot easier for them to keep on working rather than working on land, where it's going to be far too hot for them. In order to live, I try to build a bridge between my passion and a profession, by which I mean that I work as a foreign reporter with my little camera, my recorder, and then I give lectures. As well, I make nomad villagers, frozen north villagers, so that people can immerse themselves as much as possible in these adventures in boreal lands. And can you hear that hoarse voice? They've got a very hoarse voice, all the huskies. They were discovered about 4,000 years ago. And for 4,000 years, with the huskies, it's been noticed that, curiously, they have this hoarse voice, different from wolves. And so they got called huskies, because in English, husky means horse, quite simply. That's why they call that. That's good, you can go and play with the others. Contact with children is really very interesting. There are already questions which are very surprising since they've all got some idea of the universe of the frozen north with polar bears and wolves, the aurora borealis, woodland runners and trappers. And what I like in that universe is that it's remained very naive and we can really share it. There's a lot of touching with the dogs and just by the look in their eyes I get the impression that they've jumped into that universe and that they're coming with me, that I've taken them aboard my toboggan sled and they're coming on a polar expedition. So you've got the Siberian husky which comes from... Siberia. You've got the Alaskan Malmut, which comes from Alaska. The Greenland dog, which comes from Greenland. And there's the Samoyed, which comes from Sweden. From Sweden. All this contact, I mean the part with them, it's really interesting, enriching, all that communication with kids and adults. But at the same time, it's an administrative adventure because all that commercial part is there too, seeking partnerships, health certificates, to prepare for the adventures, food organizing, all that, the logistics, that's really so exhausting. I mean mentally as well as physically. Well, after that, it does you good to be out on the skids of the sled. I'm going to leave with 12 huskies. This is not at all a competition, it's a polar expedition after all. 
and the aim is to leave with 12 dogs and come back with 12 dogs, and that's why I'm training up in canine osteopathy. If both lift up the sacrum, it will extend well. Now, if I pull the tail downwards and towards me so that the angle is well inserted, that means that the sacrum will twist to the left on a right-hand axis. Sebastian came to us at the start of the year to train on dogs because of the expedition he's going to make. And with the number of dogs he'll have, it's very beneficial for the dogs. And so when he finds himself in the wild, he'll surely be able to help them enormously. Quite often there are little joint blockages which mean that the animal can't perform as well but can still function. So it'll get worn down and it'll hurt itself. He is going a long distance and he's going once again to be all by himself, so that's the objective of this training. Well, this is someone who is really close to the dogs and a really interesting student to have. You can see he's good-natured, enthusiastic and concentrated, so he's already got a certain dexterity with his hands. We're completely self-reliant. We'll get no help for my dogs or for myself from the outside. We'll have to look after ourselves. So I have to be able to treat the joints which are under great strain in these temperatures. As well, you have to take into account the load in the sled. And also, first aid. I have to be able to do mouth-to-nose breathing, heart massage, sutures, intravenous and intramuscular injections, etc., etc. Two weeks ago, Yukon Rose fought with my little female, Naoyak. It's the first time that's happened to me. It's never happened before, certainly not over a dominance issue. Yukon Rose is both my lead female and at the same time she's the pack female. So now it's a shame, but I won't be able to take her on the expedition because she's all shaved and has to wear a neck brace for about two months. So there you are. She's being looked after at the Lyon School of Veterinary Medicine. At the start, just after the accident, Yukon Rose couldn't walk at all. She had no mobility. And now she's walking better and better. Pretty much every week she has tests on a mat to see how she supports herself and how mobile she is, and especially watch the development around her plaster and stitches. For an adventure, everything has to be tied up. Well, there, it's quite clear that I'm really disgusted. That's for sure, really disgusted. But well, we'll bounce back. Bounce back uh, in a new way. Go on new adventures. And well, this adventure now, I'm doing it a little bit for her. Welcome to Christine as her team makes its way onto the search chute. I'm leaving from Whitehorse for my expedition, and I've got her at exactly the same time as the start of the West Yukon, which is a really well known race here in the Yukon. So I've come to, as they say, play the tourist, see the harnesses a bit, the packs and the sleds as well. It's two diametrically opposed worlds. There's a difference in the dogs, the team, the harnesses, at the team level, and there's an equipment difference too. And it's above all a race. My dogs are really expedition dogs, big teddy bears with a lot of fur. These are dogs that are built for racing, really very, very fit. They're called Alaskan Huskies. They're often crossbreeds with German pointers, hunting dogs with greyhounds to bring up the speed and also add power to the sled. But unfortunately, they lose the fur. They're going on a race for several days. And me, I'm going on a journey, a voyage of several months. All right, folks, when I came to the Yukon Quest... All the dogs are excited this morning. They must know it's the big parting moment.
After all that preparation, all that great administrative adventure, it's finally time to hit the road. Come on, Igloo. Igloo. Igloo, forward. Forward, Igloo. Go in, Igloo. Go in, Igloo. Well done, little wolves. Go on, Noyak. Forward, Noyak. Go on, Noyak. Forward. In terms of the route, well, each time I've got a bit of a line to follow. I'm going up with the dogs to cross over the Rockies, to go through the Alaska part, Anchorage, Fairbanks, and to come back down to cross the Rockies again. Here I'm going 7,000 kilometers, about six months' adventure. I'll follow four big stages. Those four stages, that's where I'll see people. Otherwise, I'll be completely on my own. It's a real nature route with this team. This sled which goes back and forth over the ice pack, the Rockies and the Boreal Forest. We're really going to swing through all these places. Come on, come on, Nayok. Come on, my baby. That's a good little girl. There, that's it. That's good, my girl. Go on, Igloo. That's good, my Wolfie. Go on, forward, forward, forward. No, no, left. That's good, my baby. That's good, Arthur. That's my glove. That's my glove. Thank you. Generally, I don't stop during the day to keep the team dynamic, to really keep up the speed of the sled team. So generally, I don't stop. But when I do, well, I give them a little snack. It's a mixture of fats, vitamins, fish and meat. There's also some moisture in it which allows them to rehydrate, even if during the day they're going to take the snow. But it really does them good a short break with a little snack. Hello. Sometimes it's true that you have to be a little more strict, a bit tougher with the dogs. I'm tough with myself. When I say tough, I mean finding the right balance, sometimes also raising the voice because there are difficult moments for me or the dogs to move forward, or even those times when you're on steep climbs and there's weight in the sled and it's got to be pulled, so you have to be able to push. And then you've got rivalries within the team itself. So sometimes I do have to be a little bit more strict with my companions. to see if I can trust them, and for them to see if they can trust me, they'll test me every now and then. The pack leader, he'll test me to know if he can trust me. So from time to time, he'll growl at me, try and ignore me. And those can be difficult moments, because he has to, and it's completely logical. He has to see if he can truly trust me, because that can be vital for the pack.
If I can't get obedience now, then that can be very dangerous later, if it's really a question of survival. We're going to try something out. Okay, Arthur? Igloo. Igloo. You give up your place there. There, I'm changing Nayak and putting her in swing position. I won't leave her in front because it's too fast for her. I want to see if Igloo can teach Arthur to be a lead dog. It's true that here you have to change each time, improvise a little, even on the expedition. That might seem surprising and paradoxical, but often because of the terrain, because of the temperature, and especially because of the dogs. What I'm doing, I'm putting Arthur in front as leader, and I'm putting Nayak behind, where it's a bit slower, in swing position. They're happy to be here. You can see it at a glance. I just get out the harness, the dogs are happy. Hey, we're off. Leaving, leaving again for the next stage. You can see by their look, by the way they move, how they're going to travel with that pleasure of moving forward. They see this as a kind of exchange, not especially as work. There's an aspect of pleasure, as well as the work side. This adventure for me is really a sensation of freedom. I need it. There are people who can very easily find these sensations, to be able to think about oneself and others in our own mountains and forest. I need to be 10,000 kilometers from France to be able to breathe and live simply. I changed over time the way in which I prepare these expeditions. At first I used a lot of technique, it's reassuring, there's a very reassuring aspect of technique, taking along a lot of technical things. But through experience I learned as I made the expeditions that too much technical stuff destroys your sensitivity, and so now I try to pare down things so that I can be, as much as possible, in a state of osmosis with nature. Now I try to increase my sensitivity as much as I can, and towards that complicity, that trust relationship with my dogs. Come on, Igloo! Igloo! Come on! Igloo! Come on, Igloo! I ought to put Nayak just behind Igloo. Igloo! Forward, Igloo! Igloo, igloo forward. Come on now, Igloo. Go, Igloo. Go, Igloo. Go, Igloo. Go, Igloo. Oh, that's rubbish. That won't do at all. Igloo wants to see now, Yak. Igloo only thinks about one thing, and that's to be beside Naoyak. He wants to see Naoyak. He's not used to working with Arthur in front. He wants to be behind with Naoyak. Get in front, Igloo. Before, I had Yukon Rose. This didn't cause me any problems. I had no worries. And well, here it's really at this point that I tell myself I miss Yukon Rose. But well, we'll just make do. We'll try and do it like this, and there you are. That's it. That's better. She's behind you now, Yak. Go on. Go on, little igloo. Forward. That's right, my friend. That's good, my friend. Come on now, igloo. In front. Go on. Go, igloo. Now it's starting to get really dark, but what I'm going to do is carry on the route all the same, because I've still got a lot of kilometers in front of me, and well, the temperature's all right, it must be minus 25 degrees out of the wind, so I'll carry on a little bit with the dogs. I like to move at night. It's an atmosphere somewhere between worry and competitiveness at night. Because the dogs have a totally different rhythm. Their instincts take over, and the dogs are totally different at night. They love to cover kilometer after kilometer in the dark. Igloo, get in front!
That's good, Igloo. Go on. We're away. Watch out, Igloo. Igloo, no. Front Igloo. We're going back down. Watch out, Savik. Watch out, my wolf. So, to make a good cheese fondue, we take some little sprucers, which are quite, quite cold. No, don't help me. No problem. A dog after a polar expedition is completely different, whether it's on a physical level, after all those kilometers that you've done in the day, or mentally, in its head, it's far more serene, a lot more composed after a trek, an adventure. It's as though in one way or another, and that's the case here, the dog had accomplished its task. On an expedition, you've often got time to think. And I often think about my little lead female, my little Yukon Rose, who I miss. And as well, of course, about Kadluk, the first dog that I took on a polar expedition to go around the world. Twelve years ago, I recovered a little puppy, a Siberian Husky who I called Kadluk, which means thunder in Inuit. A little two-month-old puppy, and that's how this boreal land adventure began. Kadluk gave me permission in a way, seeing that he was a Siberian husky. I thought it was a shame to have a Siberian husky and not to visit these boreal lands in the frozen north. And he guided me along the way. When I got him, he was two months old. We started training together, learnt directions, so that he could become my leader, my head dog. And next, Kadluk and I went on a little Norwegian sled and crossed over the Mackenzie River. It was then that I said to myself that this universe was really made for me through this exchange with my head dog, Kadluk, the sled and myself. Well, that really, so to speak, put my foot in the stirrup, or should we say the foot on the blades? And so I recovered another dog from the SPA, a second dog, then a third dog. And it was there that I saw, because these were dogs in a cage, really very unhappy in their cage, like you see at the SPA, but they have kept, always deep within them, a little of their animal instinct, their wild nature. And when I put on their harness, there had been three or four years of training beforehand. When I put on their harness, I could see on the ice, on the ice pack, their instinct, their wild instinct express itself as faithfully as possible. The dogs that I have now are really all from that line. It's a fine story, I think a fine story for me and also for the dogs which were at the bottom of their cages at the Animal Protection Society. I think it's a good thing and there's still more good things to come from it. A sled is easy to pilot when you have, shall we say, a good motor in front, which means the sled team. 
There's a link, there's really a kind of osmosis between the dogs when it's head dogs and the other dogs in the team, and also with the sled, so you have to direct the sled and at the same time direct the team. On the blades of the sled I use counterbalance, staying really light, really flexible around the knees to be able to turn the sled to the left and to the right. They're full of beans. Come on, a nice curve. That's great, my little wolves. A little bite in a bad place. There Igloo teaches Arthur using tough methods how to become a leader head dog. So little Arthur has to keep to his place, has to learn a bit from Igloo. And there Igloo gave him a little nip because he wasn't doing his job. He turned round to go and see Nayak. That's good little Arthur. That's all right now, Arthur. A brand new port. Each one really has its role, its position in the team. At first, there are the head dogs, who follow the directions. And then you've got the other dogs behind, who help the head dogs. The swing dogs, who help the head dogs to turn, to push into the bends. And then you go back and you have dogs that are a lot stronger, who pull the load, able to work really hard in really difficult conditions, in deep powder snow, in the boreal forest or steep climbs. And there's this sort of accordion, a shock absorber between the leaders and the other dogs behind. I communicate with my head dogs, and there are different sorts of communication. So I can tell them simply to turn to the right, turn to the left, stop, make a half right turn, half left turn, and for that there are orders. After that there are sometimes the looks. I'll be giving looks towards my leaders. I just need to look at them, make a little movement with my head, or just give them a little smile. And they'll know that they should be going a little bit faster. Or they'll know that they're going in the right direction. Or there they're not going the right way. Or there they can enjoy themselves following a trail. You see, sometimes it's a relationship which is really made of gestures and is very sensitive, with nothing really to do with the voice. The dogs have a sensitivity which is completely different to ours, these huskies, and as well as that they're really in their land, in their universe, and so they can feel things, they can even feel things that are inside me, they're able to feel things that I can never feel. A new link gets created, and then I won't have to say anything. That's good, Savik. Good, Savik. C'est bien mon boogie. That's good boogie. C'est bien mon duck. Good duck. Bien, Nayak. That's good Nayak. Now we're crossing a frozen lake. It's very cold. But it's very nice because you have the impression that you're flying, flying over the ice, flying over the snow. Here you feel that sensation well, that fine feeling of freedom.
I learnt what I know through my adventures, by my travelling experience. I've had a few nasty shocks all the same. A few frozen fingers, sutures. I've had lots of sutures, frostbite. So you can say that's how you learn. I've also found up there civilizations which remain very authentic. For the Amerindians, for the nomads of the frozen north, with the Inuits, real woodland runners, real trappers, who've taught me some skills to help make the firework, how to use a sled, things for the team, to be able to find out where I am using ice ridges, following the stars, following all that. Not taking an Argus beacon, not taking a satellite phone, it's true, that involves risk and even a big risk. It's a great challenge, but for me, it's really the most authentic counterpart possible, the most natural possible, to be able to live and feel free within this adventure. Most of the time, I try to follow the trails in the boreal forest, snowmobile tracks, sled tracks, but quite often it's me that make the tracks. Okay. Okay, let's go. That's good. There, it's hard, physical. I've got no more track to follow, so I'll have to break the trail myself, put on my snowshoes and get down from the sled, because the dogs, the leaders, they sink down too deep in the snow, so I have to go before them to open up the direction. Wait, Igloo. Follow my trace. Follow my trace, Igloo. That's good, Igloo. That's good, babies. Come on. Away we go. Yeah, dogs. Come on, dogs. While I'm installing the equipment, I'm trying above all to find a sheltered area, which is at the same time sheltered from the wind and has a bit of snow as well, a snow drift, so that the dogs can make their cocoons, their snow caves. Here I'm letting the dogs get comfortable, so I can get them their food, care for them, massage them and get the camp ready. This is quite typical of huskies. As soon as they stop, they roll into a ball, nose under their tail, to store up as much energy as possible, so they can start up as well as possible tomorrow morning. Here I'm flattening out the snow to try and get the flattest surface possible and then put my survival blanket down, which will insulate me a bit more from the ground. We'll be really fine here. If the wind doesn't get up, it'll be great. After a day in the sled, the evening is really the best moment. The time for cuddles, stroking the dogs, tending them, checking their pads, seeing that they haven't cut themselves on the ice ridges, massaging them too, stretching. It's really, dare I say, an intimate time of the day with my dogs. I used to be white, I used to be unwise. I choose your chains as my paradise. You now. I could die for you, you know I would if you want to. I burn 
collar and harness Treat me with respect and fair And the notion of warmth on these polar expeditions into the frozen north no longer exists. You have no idea of warmth. It's really always this sensation of cold. And you have to try once again, so to speak, to acclimatize yourself to the cold and this new life rhythm. It's an idea of suffering. You could perhaps say that it's 95% suffering for 5% pleasure. And when you add things up, that 5% of pleasure is very largely worth the 95% of discomfort, I can say. Well, I'm going to try get to sleep for a little bit. It must be minus 30 here. I'm going to put on my neoprene mask anyway, even if I don't know if I'll sleep much, because there'll be ice forming above, so I'll be able to breathe. Well, that will protect me a little bit, just the time to get to sleep. Good night, dogs. For many, many years, at the end of the 19th century, this was the best way of discovering the boreal lands, to go into the frozen north. Either during the gold rush or simply to transport materials, it was really the best compromise, the best means of going on a polar expedition. The dogs had at once endurance and resistance to the cold, strength, and especially a capacity for adaptation thanks to their wild instincts seeing as they are very close to wolves. It's selection which has been made over time in one way and another. They like to pull a sled, they like to run over the great wild spaces, and they like the great cold. Here we've come to a steep climb. We'll go through a pass. It'll be difficult for everyone. And I really hope it goes all right. Okay. Come on, Igloo. That's great. Come on, my friends. I know it's difficult. Come on, after that it's all downhill. After the climb, there's the descent. Come on, boys. Come on, babies. That's good. That's good, my wolves. Oh, that's good. Hey, yes, good dog there. We'll get there. That's good, wolves. Okay. Okay. Come on. Paradoxically, I'm too hot. 
It's there that you can see that everyone's working, not just the dogs. Hark it! You can try to rid yourself of your life within society, to be able to learn a new life here in the frozen north. And as you go along, always try to exist in these survival conditions, because it's more life we're talking about than survival. And there's a bit of that animal instinct which takes over, that wild instinct. And as you go along, trying to be within nature and at one with it. And furthermore, there's the animal, the beast, which takes over from the man. It's not something I'm really seeking to try and change or metamorphose myself into an animal. But it's something that happens naturally, over time, over the kilometers, during the expedition, where I will have, in the interest of survival, to acclimatize myself in a different way. Wow, Saitla. We're stopping here. Oh. Okay, okay bien, that's bien. good dogs. That's good dogs. Super. Super, c'est bien les. That's good dogs. C'est bien. That's fine my babies. That's fine Ulu. C'est bien. That's good there. C'est bien. That's good. C'est bien mon Kojo. That's good Kojo. That's fine. There, Iglu, he's saying, here we go, guys, no time to lose. We've got thousands of kilometers to travel. That's good, eh? If you want, I'll do it by myself, no problem. I'll pull the sled myself, no worries. I'm Iglu, the lead dog. I'm the best, I'm the strongest. Get rid of Arthur, please. I want to go on by myself. Hey, boy, that's it, isn't it? He's always, always going, Igloo. He's a professional, a real professional. Till the end. Right up to the tip of his tongue. That's good, my Igloo. That's good, Arthur, too. That's good, Arthur. It's true that it's nice when, with the team, you have this fine feeling of freedom. But you mustn't forget that it's very difficult financially, let's not talk sentiment, and very, very hard physically with low, low temperatures. Oh, with her baby. It's the mother and her kid. Her kid's just in front. Did you see that, dogs? Too nice. That's really beautiful. It's really at times like this that you know why you struggle. You really know why you're there. When it's really difficult, there you are. When you see things like that, those magic moments when everything else is forgotten. Well, there you are, this is where our paths separate. We've still got a lot of kilometers to travel, just the dogs and me. 